and we will officially get started. I would like to introduce you to Catherine Renner. She has been part of the development team at the Telfair Museums for just over 10 years. She is the Director of Annual Giving and the Liaison for Museum Patrons who support Telfair through an annual giving fund and membership level called the Director's Circle. Like her colleagues, Catherine supports the development team by wearing many hats, but her primary duties include fundraising, managing Director's Circle, and helping with events. And with that said, I will turn it over to Catherine. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I'd first like to thank you, Nicole, for approaching Telfair Museums with the idea of curating a custom lecture series for Palmetto Bluff, Bluff uh, residents. Um, it's a wonderful thing for our curators to be given the opportunity to share information about Telfair along with some scholarship um, about specific topics of interest to you. And second, I would like to thank all of you for uh, your interest and for tuning in. Uh, in addition to the fabulous talk you are about to hear, we would like for those of you who are not uh, involved with the museum to at least know about some of the membership opportunities that we have. So I'll just give a brief uh, overview. Um, many of you are already familiar with Telfair and its history, but for those who are not, as regional residents uh, in the area, it is a history about which you can feel very proud. Um, Harry, first slide. Sure. Telfair Museums is the oldest public art museum in the South and the first museum in America to be founded by a woman. Formerly the Telfair Family Mansion, the museum opened its doors to the public in 1886 through the bequest of Mary Telfair, creating the foundation for art and cultural education. Next, we have three buildings representing art, history, and architecture. The museum buildings are the Telfair Academy to the left, the Jepson Center to the far right, and in the center we have the Owens Thomas House and Slave Quarters. There's so much more to learn about your museum and really the best way to do that is to become a member if you're so inclined. Uh, we have memberships available at many levels and there is bound to be one that is perfect for you and your family. All memberships include unlimited access to all three sites. Our basic memberships have very affordable levels for teachers, artists, seniors, and families. Um, or you can get a contributing level membership which starts at $150 and goes to $1,000. These come with reciprocal um, privileges to over a thousand museums across the country, as well as a host of other benefits. And finally, um, next slide, there is the director circle, a level of membership very near and dear to my heart that represents our most generous patrons and our strongest supporters. This level starts at 1500 and goes to 25,000. There are great benefits to being in the director circle, some educational and some social. Next slide. Many of these are being offered virtually now, but um, what you see on the screen um, to the far left is an uncrating event, which is a behind the scenes uh, offering for director circle members. And this is a Rodin sculpture being uncrated and unwrapped and with a wench and pulleys um, being uh, put on its display site for the next um, you know, couple of months. And so this is uh, something that uh, can happen with um, the director circle support. It's a lot of fun. Um, as I said, many of these uh, benefits are being offered virtually now, but a benefit that we are currently offering to Director Circle members is early and private access to the galleries. And um, basically, you have the gallery to yourself before the museum opens uh, an hour early. Um, next slide. This is another example of uh, things that the Director Circle um, Annual Fund supports. Um, on the far left are sculptures of, of small children's hands. Uh, all the fourth graders came through the education department and they made sculptures of their own hands. And um, 
that was uh, a part of the lesson plan for the Rodin exhibit. And in the middle, we have um, a free family day. Uh, and on the far right, also a, a free family day with lots of kids activities and things that make the art really uh, stand out and uh, great experiences for the, for the, for the community. Uh, there are um, many other benefits too, but the charitable giving philosophy of our DC patrons seems to be primarily about supporting Telfair to keep it healthy and thriving for now and into the future. And uh, through their generous gift to the DC Annual Fund, support the education programs, uh, community outreach, exhibitions, and care of our collections. Um, and on the next slide um, is um, some contact information for uh, yours truly. Uh, and I would um, love to answer any questions you might have about membership in the director circle or, or in any level and, uh, or any uh, information that I can uh, share with you about the museum. So without further ado now, uh, I would like to introduce today's speaker, my esteemed colleague, uh, Harry DeLorme Jr. Harry is Senior Curator of Education for Telfer Museums, uh, is a curator, an educator, and a visual artist himself with more than 30 years experience in museums. And actually he's been at Telfair for I think almost 32 years. Uh, he holds a BFA and MFA degrees in drawing and painting from the University of uh, Georgia, Athens, where he began his museum career at the Georgia Museum of Art. He subsequently trained at two institutes for museum educators at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Harry currently oversees Telfair Museum's education department and with the education staff organizes all of our programs and resources for audiences of all ages, including lectures, family events, and school and community programs. He has also curated numerous uh, exhibitions for Telfair, including exhibitions featuring self-taught artists, local history, and 14 exhibitions of digital art and new media art for Telfair's Pulse Festival. A Savannah native, he's written for many publications and catalogs, including Telfair's permanent collection uh, highlights catalog and an upcoming um, uh, uh, curator's choice volume which will be paired with an exhibition in 2021. So Harry. Great. Thanks so much, Catherine. And uh, thank you, Nicole, and everyone at Palmetto Bluff for, for coming today to this. And uh, hopefully you will find it interesting and not terribly boring. Uh, I'm going to do my best to make it, um, make it fun, even though we're talking about a cemetery. Uh, what we've got uh, today is a, a presentation about uh, the Bird Girl and Bonaventure Cemetery. Uh, the bird girl is this sort of iconic symbol of Savannah uh, made famous by the runaway bestseller Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil published in 1994. Um, but there's a long history to both the bird girl and to Bonaventure Cemetery. Many, uh, many of you I'm sure have visited Bonaventure at some point. Um, it's a really fascinating place. Um, there's incredible history there, a lot of art history there. Um, so we're gonna get a bit into that today and look at some of the ways that Bonaventure has uh, both supported artists and inspired artists over the years and uh, and see how the bird girl, girl fits into that story. So um, I'm going to take you on a little little bit of a journey there. Before we do that, I want to encourage everyone to come by the uh, Telfair and to our Telfair Academy building. And of course, two of our buildings are on the same square, Telfair Square. You can find the Jetson Center and the Telfair Academy there. And at the Telfair Academy, we have an exhibition called Before Midnight, Bonaventure and the Bird Girl. So if you wanna see the Bird Girl in person and see some of the other art I'm talking about today, not all of it, uh, you'll see some of it in this exhibition, which is currently on view, will be up um, for the rest of this year uh, at the Telfair Academy. So please come by and see that if you have the chance. So um, let's talk a little bit about Bonaventure Cemetery. I think most people, um, again, know it through Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Um, some of you may have visited uh, Bonaventure. This is a view of it uh, in what is probably the best month to, to visit uh, Bonaventure, which is March, when you see all the azaleas blooming. Um, that's been a major uh, influence on a lot of painters, particularly, and we'll see some of their work a bit later on. Um, but it's a really beautiful and picturesque uh, cemetery, often makes some of the, uh, the world's uh, top 10 uh, most uh, beautiful cemeteries. 
uh, and it has some really unusual um, qualities to it. Um, you know, some of the most world's most famous cemeteries, you think about Père Lachaise, or you think about uh, Recoleta in, um, in Buenos Aires, places like that, these very urban cemeteries. Bonaventure belongs to the tradition of rural, rural cemeteries, um, these sort of picturesque cemeteries, and we're gonna hear a little bit more about that a bit later on. Uh, if you haven't visited Bonaventure, I highly encourage you to go check it out. It's of course free to visit. It's in a beautiful location right on the Wilmington River. Um, there's incredible funerary art out there, um, funerary architecture. Some of it, uh, you know, has, has this very Egyptianate, um, you know, style going on, like the two you see there on the right, and of course um, the landscaping, the incredible live oak trees, and the flowers, which of course are in bloom in the springtime there. So a great place to visit. Um, but let's talk a little bit about um, why Bonaventure is there, what it is, how it came to be. Um, Bonaventure was originally established in the 1760s as a plantation um, overlooking uh, what was then called St. Augustine Creek, we now call it the Wilmington River. And it was uh, established by a British colonel named John Mulrine, uh, who owned it along with his son-in-law, Josiah Tatnell. Uh, and uh, they, were, um, they owned a lot of property in South Georgia, a lot of timber property that was harvested uh, by enslaved people. Um, they uh, were staunch loyalists. So during the Revolutionary War period, um, they were supporters of the British. They actually helped um, the British governor, Sir James Wright, escape to a ship uh, docked nearby um, through Bonaventure. So they aided his escape. Uh, later in 1779, um, during the siege of Savannah, a very bloody uh, battle, um, Bonaventure was used as a hospital uh, for the uh, American troops and their allies, including the French and Haitian soldiers who fought alongside the uh, American colonists. Uh, and so it was used as a field hospital there. Um, you know, after the ouster of the British, finally in 1782, Bonaventure was confiscated because uh, Mulrine and Tatmo were loyalists. Of course, they, they fled Georgia uh, and, um, and Bonaventure was, uh, was later sold to John Habersham, who later sold it back to the Tatnell family. It was purchased by Josiah Tatnell Jr. in 1783. Um, there you see a little map of, of uh, Bonaventure and you see the hospital there. That's from the Siege of Savannah period. Uh, and then Josiah Tatnell Jr.'s wife uh, was actually became the first uh, person to be buried at, at Bonaventure. A small family cemetery was established by the Tatnells there in 1802. So that is, you know, it's a very old cemetery. That is the oldest burial that we know of there, although it's very likely that there are, there were French, um, possibly American and Haitian soldiers buried out there as well when it was a field hospital um, predating that. Uh, so Bonaventure, again, has this little cemetery, that, and you can still see that cemetery today if you go out there. The Tatnell's uh, uh, plot is still out there today. Uh, but in the uh, 1840s, a man named Peter Wiltberger purchases Bonaventure from the last of the Tatnells to own the property uh, the, with the idea of creating a privately owned uh, but public cemetery. And I'll get into the reasons for this in, in a few minutes, but it was a time when the city of Savannah was really in need of cemetery space. Uh, and then uh, after uh, Peter Wiltberger passes away, his son, um, William Wiltberger, takes over uh, Bonaventure. Uh, it, Bonaventure is renamed Evergreen. And uh, this was a time when uh, rural cemeteries were coming, uh, were coming into popularity, um, cemeteries that were located outside of the city. Bonaventure is located outside of Savannah. Uh, so they were in these more rural settings, and Evergreen gave this idea, you know, this idea of a lush, you know, green um, space, a park-like environment. Uh, and then moving forward in history, Bonaventure is purchased by the city of Savannah in 1907 um, as a public cemetery. In 1909, a Jewish section is added to Bonaventure. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we skip way ahead uh, to when Bonaventure really becomes world famous. It's, it's very famous early on, I should point out, but uh, becomes, of course, internationally famous in 1994 when Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil is published. And of course, there are scenes in the book set at the cemetery. Um, there's later the movie uh, made from the book. Uh, and, um, and of course, um, Bonaventure has been incredibly popular with um, tourists visiting from everywhere um, since that time. Uh, in 2001, Bonaventure was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. On the left there, you see a map of the Evergreen Cemetery at Bonaventure uh, from the late 19th century drawn by 
uh, John Hogg, who was a um, surveyor uh, and uh, employee of the city of Savannah at one time. Uh, Telfair Museums also has a long connection with Bonaventure through Mary Telfair, uh, who um, was actually one of the early folks to purchase a uh, family plot out there. Um, and actually before that, long before that, she visited Bonaventure and, and in this now lost painting from 1834 on the left, you see Mary Telfair on horseback visiting Bonaventure with a couple of her friends uh, and they're visiting this, that's the Tattnall um, burial plot there um, with uh, the artist kind of represents, uh, I think mistakenly represents uh, live oaks as weeping willows, it looks like in the background, but, uh, but that is one of the earliest uh, depictions of Bonaventure that I have located uh, when working on this exhibition. On the right is the Telfair family's uh, monument or vault out there created by the Philadelphia Company Struthers and Sons in 1860. So it's one of the earlier, um, earlier tombs that you'll see out there and Mary Telfair was later buried there in 1875 after her death uh, and you can still see that out there um, today. Um, and before I get delve further into the artist at Bonaventure, I just wanted to point out that Bonaventure is just one of a group of historic cemeteries that you can visit in Savannah. And they're all fascinating and all have really amazing history once you um, start to um, poke around in them. Um, and just, I'm not gonna go into detail about all of these, but on the upper left, that is Savannah's Colonial Cemetery, uh, which um, houses signers of the Declaration of Independence. It has these uh, really interesting above ground vaults, very distinctive vaults. Some of them have uh, uh, actually the barrels are some eight feet underground accessed by stairs, which of course are no longer accessible. Uh, really interesting place. Um, there was something like, there were thousands of burials there. Um, on the, uh, also in that upper row, you see two very old uh, Jewish cemeteries. Two of the, they're not the oldest um, Jewish cemetery, not the first one to be established, uh, but uh, they're both from the 1860s and they both are still in existence on the west side of Savannah's historic district today. Down below you see Laurel Grove uh, Cemetery. There's a Laurel Grove North, uh, which you see on the lower left, and a Laurel Grove South, which in this, was in the center. The reason for that is because these are two, uh, these are segregated cemeteries. Laurel Grove um, was actually the, one of the first, uh, also like Bonaventure, was one of the first rural cemeteries uh, in this part of the country. It was established in 1853 on the west side of Savannah. And uh, the reason uh, that Laurel Grove was established and why Bonaventure sprang up and why other cemeteries like the Catholic Cemetery on the lower right uh, were uh, also built in the mid 19th century is because the original burial grounds of Savannah, um, particularly the uh, colonial burial ground, uh, what we now call the colonial burial ground, the upper left in that photograph, um, were filling up. And uh, they, there was really not a very uh, pleasant place to go. It, there, was, there were terrible odors. The, the place was overcrowded with burials. It was not great. Um, the city needed to do something. And so you started to see these other cemeteries get developed. And the city first developed um, Laurel Grove north and south um, because uh, of the need for more space not only because a colonial cemetery um, was filled, but uh, the African-American burial ground, which is uh, where Whitfield Square in Savannah is located today, was also um, filled to capacity and the city was expanding further in that area. And so um, Laurel Grove North was established for white burials. Laurel Grove South was established for African-American burials. Um, Laurel Grove South is an incredibly interesting place with the burials of enslaved people um, with very famous people, with early um, clergymen from Savannah, civil rights leaders like W.W. W. Law are buried there, um, every, all the way up to the rapper Camouflage is buried there. So really interesting place um, with all of these places have very deep history going on that's worthy of exploration. The Catholic Cemetery also established in the mid 19th century in Savannah uh, because there was not consecrated ground for Catholics at Laurel Grove Cemetery. And Bonaventure, I should point out, although it was first established in the 1840s, was a private cemetery to begin with. And the lots could only be afforded by the most wealthy citizens of Savannah. That changed in the 1860s, and you begin to see more of a proliferation of burials at Bonaventure by the 1860s. Uh, now, I mentioned the rural cemetery movement. Um, the rural cemetery movement, again, was this kind of response to um, you know, everything from hygiene to romanticism. So you have um, these uh, overcrowded urban, you know, churchyards and cemeteries and uh, cities had to do something about that. And they realized it was probably more sanitary to move those cemeteries outside of the city limits. 
And so they would often put these in um, kind of rural or just outside the city, um, rural locations. Uh, and they created these sort of park-like um, you know, environments. Uh, and uh, some of the earliest ones, uh, you know, the, one of the first ones was in Massachusetts. You see some of the, some of the early uh, uh, rural cemeteries mentioned on the stereo card view that we have here. This is from a series of stereo cards um, with photographs showing these rural cemeteries like Greenwood in Brooklyn. You'll see a mention of Magnolia Cemetery in Charleston. And then you'll notice there were um, a number of views, six views of Bonaventure in this one series of stereo cards uh, on that, that you can see on the list on the right. Um, Bonaventure was really well known from early days um, because of this incredible um, canopy of live oak trees that had been planted during the time when the Mulrines owned um, Bonaventure. So it had really become this mature canopy and was just this incredibly lush uh, environment and one that um, really drew photographers once photography became uh, a thing. Uh, so um, we'll see more examples of that in just a moment. Um, and, uh, and this is a good place really to start talking about the involvement of artists with Bonaventure. And that really begins with that image I showed you of Mary Telfair from the 1830s. This is a, uh, a gravestone for a marker for uh, an artist named Annie Cuck, who was born in the 1880s, uh, died in the 1960s. Um, this is out at Bonaventure, and you'll see the, an artist's palette and brushes on her, um, on her gravestone. There are a number of artists buried at Bonaventure, but I think more importantly, um, Bonaventure was a place for, um, for art, um, for um, sculpture to be placed, as well as a place that inspired artists, as we'll see. Uh, another one of the earliest paintings that I found um, that was painted at Bonaventure is the view on the left by a British-born artist named Thomas Addison Richards who came to the US um, at the age of 11 with his parents um, to um, the Augusta, Georgia area. He later, um, he had some kind of artistic training as a very young man um, in England and began teaching art when he got to the United States, uh, also in his youth and producing views of Georgia. And um, here in 1838, um, he depicts Bonaventure Cemetery at a time before it was actually a cemetery, when it was still a plantation. And this is a rather poor um, photograph. I'm sorry about that. But you can see already at this time, you have this canopy of oaks, um, this sort of avenue of oak trees that we're looking down there. You have people strolling along it on the left, where on the right, um, again, it's hard to see, um, but there are a group of African-American, likely enslaved laborers um, working on the right, maintaining the property. Richards also um, produced um, prints uh, and etchings and engravings. And you see a couple of those um, there from Harper's Weekly um, uh, depicting Bonaventure. On the upper right, you can see the uh, bridge that once led to Bonaventure. And there's a rustic arch gateway that led into the cemetery. And on the lower right is Richards uh, uh, engraving after a painting by another artist, uh, the artist Henry Kleenwerk, um, a Belgian who uh, painted these romantic landscapes. And he was actually, brief, had briefly set up shop in Savannah in the late 1850s, around 1860s, sort of on the cusp of the American Civil War. And this painting is in Telfair's collection. You can see it today in the exhibition. It's a really gorgeous painting and a little slice of history, but it's also a, a good reminder of, of why um, you can't always take paintings at face value because sometimes artists do change things about, around a little bit. They take artistic license. So this is a view of Bonaventure, again, this very romantic view with the lush dripping uh, you know, moss-draped oak trees. Uh, and we see some of the uh, landmarks that would have existed there at the time. There is the Tattnall plot back here, some of these early uh, burials out at Bonaventure. This is the Clinch tomb, which was put out at Bonaventure in the 1840s. Um, and off in the background, you can barely see the rustic entrance gate. And there's the Wilmington River behind that. The only problem is not all of this stuff is in the same view like you see it there. The artist creatively rearranged it so all of those landmarks were in the same painting. It does give us a little window though into sort of the social um, situations of the time. Um, you see, um, you know, uh, as of the 1830s, I, as I mentioned, Mary Telfer was out there bringing friends and guests out there. She later went on carriage rides out there. And remember, there were not public parks at the time so much. And so cemeteries, especially these cemetery, these rural cemeteries became sort of the, uh, they were the parks and people would go take picnic lunches out there with the family on a weekend and hang out. Um, in, in this image, uh, in the center of this image, you can see, um, you know, uh, white folks, um, you know, well-dressed, 
um, strolling through the cemetery, taking carriage rides. Over here on the left, you see uh, very likely an enslaved nursemaid um, holding a small white child by the hand there. So it's also a window into um, what was going on in Savannah at the time. This is again, just before the Civil War. Um, and uh, again, painted in 1860. It's one of two paintings that clean work is most noted, known to have painted of Bonaventure. Um, after the Civil War, um, photographers increasingly uh, went to Bonaventure. And here you see two images by George N. Barnard, um, who actually was a photographer who was traveling with Union forces, with Sherman's troops, as they marched through Georgia. And after the war, um, he actually went back and revisited some of the locations he had seen, including Savannah. And he published a view of locations, uh, a, a series of views of locations along Sherman's march to the sea, <clears throat> including Savannah, which of course was spared uh, the burning and devastation of other Southern cities. Um, so you have views of downtown Savannah, of the river, of Forsyth Park, and Barnard has two photographs in that volume of Bonaventure that you see here. Um, so Bonaventure became known um, you know, early on by the 1860s. Um, it was already getting out there in popular photography. This was a volume that was published um, in 1886. And long, oh, and I should point out around the same time, others were discovering Bonaventure and writing about it. So you have John Muir, of course, best known as the co-founder of the Sierra Club, who was um, you know, traveling, you know, his a uh, thousand mile you know, walk um, to the Gulf of Mexico. And he was stranded in Savannah and waiting for a family to send him cash. Uh, and uh, he didn't have any place to stay. So he camped out at Bonaventure and he wrote about the experience later on uh, and about the natural beauty of the place. And this is a quote from John Muir. He says, I gazed awestricken as one new arrived from another world. Bonaventure is called a graveyard, a town of the dead, but the few graves are powerless in such a depth of life. The rippling of living waters, the sound of birds, the joyous confidence of flowers, the calm, undisturbable grandeur of the oaks marks this place of graves as one of the Lord's most favored abodes of life and light. So Bonaventure gained this reputation as well as this sort of beautiful uh, natural, natural location early on. And that's something you see reflected in uh, stereo views um, produced by a number of artists, both in Savannah and uh, national companies that um, bought their work or sent other photographers down to photograph Bonaventure. And what you're looking at here is an image, um, actually a, a pair of images of Bonaventure taken by a local photographer named DJ Ryan, who I, I always get a chuckle when I hear DJ Ryan. It sounds like some guy who would be performing in a club somewhere downtown. But he's a, uh, a photographer who had a, um, a business downtown Savannah. Um, he produced these stereo cards and, and basically what these were, uh, if anyone had a Viewmaster as a child, if anybody remember those, um, you know, the, the photographer takes two images at slightly different angles. And so when you look at them through the device, which is one of these little devices that this young man is holding here, um, your brain blends those two images together to create a 3D image. So it's an early form of 3D, a 3D um, viewer. And uh, so, you, you know, you, again, you're in, your, in your, your brain, you'll see the one image as a 3D image. And that's another example here. Um, your couple of uh, uh, guys uh, kind of sitting out here on the grass enjoying a picnic lunch. Remember I mentioned that cemeteries were a place where people would go to have uh, picnics and, and family outings. So stereo cards became very, very popular uh, beginning in the 1860s, going up through the turn of the century. And so a lot of photography of Bonaventure that happened during that period was in the form of these stereo cards. And you'll see a couple examples of those if you come in to see the exhibition um, at the Telfair. Another form of art that we see um, really um, coming into play by the mid 19th century uh, in Bonaventure is stonework and sculpture and a funerary sculpture and Bonaventure, Bonaventure is a great repository of funerary sculpture. And there are some uh, artists that we associate with Bonaventure and other historic cemeteries in Savannah area. Um, one of the first was Robert D. Walker and you see his business there on the left and his stone yard actually was on the same block of York Street in Savannah that the building I'm sitting in, the Jepson Center now stands on. Uh, and you can see all of those monuments there in the background. Um, some of those were possibly carved on site. Some may have been shipped in and then personalized by, uh, by Walker and his employees in Savannah. On the right, you see an image by Walker um, out at Bonaventure. This is a marker for Julius Coots from 1877. 
an example of the kind of funerary art that you could um, purchase at that time. And there were a number of stone yards that popped up in late 19th century Savannah, and a lot of them were actually located right there around York Street, around where the Jepson Center is. Um, this is another piece that I, that I think is by Robert Walker or one of his contemporaries. Uh, one other thing that's really fascinating about these, these older grave markers, and I would encourage you to go out there and explore. It's really fun. Uh, of course, I, I say it's fun. My wife always says, why are you going out there? It's just full of dead people. And it's like, well, yeah, but it's really cool too. There's all this great sculpture and history and all these fun things to look for. So um, here we've got um, a marker to um, uh, a guy named Frank Walden. And in, the, in that marker, you see embedded a little carving of a pair of hands shaking. And I don't know if anyone's familiar with that symbol, but in these, these gravestones, that's usually the sign of a married person, a mar or a married couple. And usually it's a male and female hand um, that you see shaking there. And you'll find a lot of other, um, other symbolism. I don't have time to go into all of it today. Urns, draped urns, uh, palm fronds, uh, roses, uh, doves, lambs, and so on. So you'll see a lot of different symbolism when you go out there. I encourage you to explore that. But you'll find a lot of this, um, particularly in these 19th century um, grave markers out at Bonaventure. Now, the, the, the artist who I think is most synonymous with Bonaventure, other than Sylvia Shaw Judson and her bird girl, is a guy named John Walls. And Walls was uh, actually brought to Savannah by Telfair Museums. Uh, uh, what you're looking at there on the left is a photograph of the Telfair Academy when it was under construction in 1884. And this is a time when the Telfair House was being transformed into an art museum and the large addition, the art galleries were built onto the back of the original house. And you'll see some crates there being deposited on these plinths. Those actually held these sculptures like the one here. This is a sculpture of Raphael thought to be by John Walls. Now Walls was a sculptor uh, who was born in Germany. His parents um, uh, died when he was very young. He was orphaned at a relatively young age and sent to live with his sister in Philadelphia. And while there, he learned stone cutting as a young man and uh, scraped by and earned his way back to Europe to study sculpture professionally in France and elsewhere. And, you know, in, uh, and then he winds up as an apprentice in the workshop of a uh, sculptor named Victor Tilner in Vienna. And while he's working there, this guy in the middle with the fez and the goatee, uh, Carl Brandt, who was the first director of the Telfer Museums, walks in and orders a set of sculptures of famous artists from history that will go in front of the Telfair Academy, which is being constructed in Savannah. So that's, uh, this is how John Walls came to Savannah. It's thought he came here to oversee the installation of these five sculptures in front of the Telfair. And he apparently did well here. He um, set up his own business in Savannah. I think he maintained ties in Philadelphia, but he um, set up a business in Savannah. And you can see his work uh, in all of Savannah's historic cemeteries, as well as in uh, uh, architecture, um, like this um, piece on the right, which you'll see up in the tympanum um, over the Chatham Academy, which is now the Savannah Chatham County Board of Education building on Bull Street. Um, Walls is most famous, however, for his sculpture of little Gracie Watson, a six-year-old girl who died tragically um, uh, and was the, the daughter of the proprietors of the Pulaski House Hotel here in Savannah. And apparently the parents brought her photograph to John Walls and he created this beautiful sensitive uh, sculptural portrait of her uh, from the photograph um, in 1894, completed it in 1894. Uh, you can find that out at Bonaventure today. It's now got a fence around it because uh, it was, you know, all the tourists kept bringing things, toys and other things and putting them on Gracie. Um, her nose was broken off at some point. So to protect her, um, Bonaventure now has a gate, uh, a, a railing, a, an iron uh, rail around it. Um, but it's a beautiful portrait. Um, just look at the detail of the child's dress there. Um, you have a tree here that's been cut off, a symbol of a life that's been cut short. Um, again, that kind of symbolism that you find in these 19th century grave markers. Walls has a lot of other work out there, and I encourage you to go out and hunt around, and you will find his signature in many places. There are about 77 works created by Walls out of Bonaventure today. This is the Gertrude A. Bliss uh, Millen Monument from 1905. Uh, Walls was active out there between the 1890s and his death in, in 1922. And he copyrighted a lot of his work. And in fact, his wife is said to have burned all of his designs when he, when he died. 
and sadly, Walls himself did not have a marker at Bonaventure until one was put there in just in recent years by the Bonaventure Historical Society. Here are some other examples you can find out at Bonaventure, a monument to the Wayless children on the upper left. On the right, this is the Schaefer Monument. Look at this, another tree that's been cut down and uh, the name is engraved in the tree. We've got other symbols like the palm here. You've got a, notice what this is, a, a, an hourglass with wings attached to it, you know, a tempest fugit. Um, so again, there's a lot of interesting symbolism to look for there, uh, but a beautifully carved piece. So this, it's really like an outdoor sculpture park, well worth exploring. Another uh, artist who worked out at Bonaventure was an Italian immigrant from Sicily named Antonio Alifi, who was said to have been recruited about 1910 um, to come to the U.S. and help out in Walls' business. Um, there he is on the upper left with his flood monument, which is out at the Catholic Cemetery. On the right, uh, on the lower left is a, uh, a sculpture that he made for the Sons of Italy, uh, a fraternal group in New York City. On the right is the Orsini Monument at Bonaventure, which is probably um, the most elaborate piece out there that is supposedly created by Alifi. Uh, Alifi also likely created this piece, which is part of the Arsini uh, group there. Uh, and um, uh, you'll notice too that um, the last monument and this one, the, the date of death there is 1918. So some of you might be able to guess why Bonaventure and other cemeteries here saw a surge of uh, burials at that time because they were going through another pandemic a hundred years ago. And that's, uh, so you'll find a lot of burials from that that time period um, out there. Um, other sculpture you'll find at Bonaventure includes uh, work by Italian uh, masters. Um, uh, folks who had lots of cash were able to order um, custom sculptures by, um, by noted Italian artists. Um, often these were well-established um, stone cutters uh, and, uh, and artists. Uh, like this one, uh, this is the Corinne Lawton Memorial uh, from 1879, created by an artist named Benedetto Civiletti from uh, Palermo, uh, Sicily. Uh, and this piece, um, the Lawton Memorial Arch, created in 1898 by Professor Raffaello Romanelli of Florence. Um, so uh, again, a lot, of, um, a lot of really great sculpture um, out there to explore. Uh, I'm gonna move ahead because we're running a little low on time. Another one of the uh, monument companies that worked out at Bonaventure was based in Savannah and actually is still based in Savannah. This is the oldest stone yard um, still in existence, um, Oglethorpe Marble and Granite Company here in Savannah. It was established in uh, 1907 by a guy named G.B. Little, who came here from Charleston. And uh, he created monuments from scratch, but he also offered uh, monuments like this one, which you could order from, a, this is Italian statuary that you could order from a catalog. And then Little's company would personalize that statue once you had ordered it and then install it at Bonaventure or wherever, which of the cemeteries you were, you were placing it in. Um, so this is actually a catalog that the company still has. Um, this is uh, the third generation of this family still operates this business today here in Savannah. A couple of the other uh, pieces of theirs that you'll see out at Bonaventure on the left is, the, is a marble gateway for the uh, Jewish section of Bonaventure. Uh, which was established in 1909, uh, but this arch um, dates back to 1914. Uh, and then on the right, uh, Milton J. Little, G.B. Little's son, created a whole group of monuments for the Gibbons family out at Bonaventure, which you can see today. Uh, in addition to the kind of funerary markers and sculpture that I've been talking about, Bonaventure has a lot of other sculptural interest in the form of uh, things like ironwork, cast iron, uh, and uh, decorative tile work. And so I'm not gonna dwell on this, but um, you'll see these, uh, these really interesting uh, Victorian garden tiles on the left. Um, some of these were made here in Georgia, others were imported from England, um, like the one with the rope border that you see in the upper um, photograph. Um, identical um, tiles have been pulled out of the Thames uh, in, in London. Um, so um, these markers are out there. They often were used as a coping around graves um, sadly, the markers, along with ironwork, were very prone to theft. Um, so if you see these turn up in an antique store, I would advise you not to buy them because there were a lot of them that were pilfered from the historic cemeteries. On the right are some samples of decorative cast ironwork from Bonaventure. And of course, if you go out there today, you will still see some great examples like this one, um, the Holst um, plot, uh, the gate to the Holst plot, which was created by Robert Wooden Company of Philadelphia. Um, this was a company that produced ironwork for cities all over the country. A lot of the ironwork in uh, the New Orleans Garden District was supposedly created by this company. And you can see the name. Uh, again, look for the, the maker's mark 
on a lot of these uh, monuments as well as the ironwork out there. <clears throat> I'm gonna also divert very briefly because Bonaventure um, has a sister cemetery which also has a lot of sculptural interest and history. It's named Greenwich. Um, so it's right next to Bonaventure. The road that goes to Greenwich is right next to Bonaventure. And it was added as a sister cemetery in the 1930s. But Greenwich was like Bonaventure, a, uh, an 18th century plantation site. Apparently it's where some of the first soybeans were grown in North America. And it's got a really interesting history. If you go out there today, you'll see this beautiful uh, marble fountain, uh, which dates, dates back to the late 19th century. And I'll show you where that comes from in a second. And a pair of decorative pools also from uh, a late 19th century estate that was built out there. Um, and that estate uh, is this one, uh, which was created for the naval stores magnate uh, Spencer Schotter, who controlled the world's naval stores markets um, until he was brought down by an antitrust lawsuit in the 1910s. But before that, he created this massive house out at Greenwich, right next to Bonaventure, and filled it with art by European masters. He had paintings by Sir Joshua Reynolds and Gainsborough and Rosa Bonheur and, and others. And uh, it was a fabulous place. And uh, again, when Schotter lost his fortunes, um, he wound up selling it to uh, the Tory family of Detroit, a Dr. H.N. Tory. Uh, and uh, while Tory was, on, was owner of the place, um, there you see the sculptures that once adorned the gardens out there. Schotter had bought um, uh, real Roman sculptures from dealers in Rome and installed them out there on the grounds of Greenwich. And on the right, um, you can see there, um, this is actually a still from a film. Uh, Greenwich was a very popular place for silent movies. It was, a, it was a location set for several silent films, including the one you see there, which was called Stolen Moments, which starred Margaret Namara, um, who you see running past the sculpture there, and a very young Rudolph Valentino. Uh, unfortunately, Greenwich burned in 1923 to the ground. Um, the Tory family relocated and built a house on Ossabaugh Island that still stands today. There's another view of Greenwich there um, and the Roman statuary. And you can see some of this Roman statuary, which today belongs to the city of Savannah, but has been placed on long-term loan to Telfer Museum. So you'll see this Roman Janus head Herm here um, in the exhibition. On the right, um, photographers have dra been drawn to Greenwich as well as Bonaventure. This is Jack Lee's photograph, Live Oak and Pond, which was the cover of his book, The Land I'm Bound To. So there's our little diversion to Greenwich and let's hop back to Bonaventure and see what was happening there in the 20th century. Uh, by the 1920s, we have visual artists really discovering Bonaventure. This is uh, work by the Savannah Art Club, artists like Emma Wilkins uh, of Savannah and Hattie Saucy. They were American Impressionist painters. These women had had the opportunity to go and study in, uh, in Europe, in Paris, uh, and were part of the Savannah Art Club, a group that formed at Telfair in 1920. And many of them painted in an American Impressionist style, and they were highly, uh, highly attracted to uh, the uh, flowers that bloomed at Bonaventure, these, these azaleas, these red azaleas, particularly that bloomed at Bonaventure every March. Other American artists stopped by Bonaventure over the years. Louis Boucher, an American realist painter, um, came by in the late 40s, early 50s, and made this painting. Uh, and then photographers like Edward Weston um, came through and photographed Bonaventure for a series um, that was meant to illustrate a, a limited edition uh, version, uh, a portfolio version of, uh, of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. And this uh, view of Bonaventure by Edward Weston um, is, is really gorgeous. It's sort of a natural arch here created by the oak trees with this back lighting, lighting that almost makes it look like it's inside a church. On the far left of that image, you can see the Telfer family tomb that I showed you earlier. And if you go out there today, you'll see the same view that Edward Weston photographed in 1941. You can still see pretty much that same view if you go out to Bonaventure today. There were also landscape architects working out at Bonaventure like Claremont Lee, who was the first uh, registered female landscape architect in the state of Georgia and the most prominent landscape architect in Georgia and in Savannah for, for decades. Um, she designed not only um, uh, plots out at Bonaventure, but also historic gardens in Savannah, like the one at Telfair's Owens Thomas House and Slave Quarters, as well as uh, several of Savannah's historic squares. And this brings us to um, the artist that um, I wanted to kind of uh, end um, or come close to ending with, with a discussion of her work. This is Sylvia Shaw Judson. And her work is, is really synonymous with Bonaventure, uh, her work, The Bird Girl, even though it was not designed as a funerary sculpture, and it was not designed originally to go at Bonaventure. 
Um, so where did this sculpture come from? Well, Sylvia Shaw Judson uh, was uh, uh, you know, a professionally trained artist. Um, she had the opportunity to, um, her father was, was an architect. She was able to uh, study, um, uh, study sculpture in Paris. She studied under the artist uh, Antoine Bourdel, although she said later she really learned more from her peers, the other students working there than she did from the great master. Um, but she studied sculpture professionally, came back to the United States. She apprenticed in New York under a prominent sculptor named Anna Hyatt, later Anna Hyatt Huntington. Uh, and Anna Hyatt Huntington at that time was working on a major commission, which was the equestrian, equestrian sculpture of Joan of Arc uh, in New York City on Riverside Drive. And Anna Hyatt Huntington might be familiar to some of you if you've ever been up to Brook Green Gardens uh, in Murrells Inlet, South Carolina, which is this massive outdoor sculpture park that she established there in 1931. Uh, on the left is a uh, sculpture by Anna Hyatt Huntington of a pair of swans. She particularly excelled in animal sculpture like the one you see there. Sylvia Shaw Judson um, certainly had an incredible role model in Anna Hyatt Huntington, and she set about on a career as a sculptor. Um, and you can fi actually find her work, like the one on the lower right there at Brook Green Gardens. On the left, though, the Bird Girl is her most famous work, and the Bird Girl has a long history. Um, she wasn't originally called the Bird Girl. She was originally made as a commission for a garden, a seaside garden in Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, Judson um, had a young girl pose for the sculpture. Um, she sculpted the piece originally in clay uh, and uh, then cast it, uh, made six casts. There were six casts that she made between 1936 and 1940. There was one cast in lead and the other five were in bronze. And so the one that you see here, the one that was once in Bonaventure is now at Telfair, was cast one of those five bronze casts that she had made. Now the bird girl would originally have been sculpted in clay and you can actually see that clay texture in the bronze sculpture. So the artist would have created this in plastiline, which is kind of an oily clay that retains its shape. And then a mold would be made um, over that, that clay model. And then the mold would be taken apart and of course be, would be put back together again and you could you know, cast it in whatever metal um, that you wanted to, usually bronze. And then the artist would create a surface patina uh, treatment um, for that bronze sculpture. Um, so you can see that modeling of the sculpture. Um, this is really beautiful, the tilt of the head there. Um, it's very modern sculpture. It's sort of streamlined, um, very kind of an art deco sculpture. Um, another thing about this um, sculpture is that uh, Judson uh, originally called it, um, I think, standing figure, then she called it girl with bowls. Um, but at one point, apparently, she intended it for a fountain and she it calls it fountain figure. In fact, she exhibited a cast of the Burr Girl at the Art Institute of Chicago, no less, in the 1930s, I think it was 1938, uh, as fountain figure. And so Bird Girl would originally have been piped and water could, could be piped up through the bowls and then would drain out. It would be a thin stream of water draining out the front of each of those bowls. And so that is, um, sorry, let's go back. So you would have seen the sculpture uh, maybe placed in a fountain. We only know of one instance where one of these was placed in a fountain. And you would see this little trickle of water draining from the bowls there. It was not piped with water, um, the one that was placed out at Bonaventure. In the late 1930s, the Trosdale family of Savannah was working with a landscape architect who is thought to have bought the cast of Bird Girl that made its way to Savannah from a New York gallery. And this, this would have been the original location of the Bird Girl. Now, um, something happened though in the 1990s and that is a book called Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Um, the photographer Jack Lee, a very prominent um, photographer uh, from, uh, based in Savannah, uh, was, uh, was hired or was uh, recommended by John Barrett, the author of Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil to Random House to take the cover photograph for this book about Savannah. And so Jack Lee makes arrangements to go out to the cemetery um, after hours. And on the second night he's there, he doesn't have a very long window of time to do this. He has to get something to Random House pretty quickly. And so on that, the second night he was out there as the light was ebbing, he stumbles across the bird girl and he decides this is it, this is perfect. And so he takes an image of the bird girl, but the image that he takes is not much like the one that we see on the book jacket. And if you look at this on the left, um, Susan Laney, who, um, who sells work um, from Jack Lee's estate today uh, at Laney Contemporary Gallery, um, had, some, had images showing the process behind the making of the Burr Girl. And this is one of those images which um, shows what that 
initial print um, might look like. And Jack Lee did not have access to Photoshop and these advanced photo editing tools, digital tools that we have right now. Um, he did this work painstakingly in the darkroom and went through something like 20 steps to create the image that we see here, dodging and burning and emphasizing parts of the composition to create this backlighting um, behind the figure, this sort of glow around the bird girl and really emphasizing her. And, he, and when he shot the image, he used the technique called lens compression to make the figure appear more monumental because she's really not that large in real life. And so again, the book uh, went on, I mean, the uh, sculpture and the photograph became, uh, you know, uh, again, this really um, internationally famous image thanks to the uh, best-selling book. The sculpture um, was visited by tourists who trampled over the uh, the family plot at Bonaventure, and so the family removed the bird girl, um, put it into storage for a while, and then eventually loaned it to Telfer Museums, and this is where you can see her today. Now, uh, bird girls also influenced other artists. This is a walking stick uh, by uh, Willis Jones Sr., who was one of a group of men, um, African-American men, who were carving walking sticks in Savannah, which is another long and really interesting tradition, um, but this is a, uh, a view of his Good and Evil Cain, which includes the bird girl here. And he said this was the head of Adam up at the top. And there's a snake coiling around the cane, uh, trying to get an, an apple there. Um, so that's a piece that was influenced by the bird girl. And of course, other artists have since gone out to Bonaventure, including the photographer Maria von Mathiasen, who visited Bonaventure with Jack Lee, as you can see in this photograph here. Um, she took photographs of models in Savannah. Um, and she collaborated with these models and hairstylists who reinterpreted sites around the city uh, in hairstyles. And this one is called the Crowning Glory hairdo. Uh, and the model is posing under a grave marker with a crown image um, that you see there descending from the clouds. Another artist to work out at Bonaventure in the 90s after Jack Lee is David DeLong, um, who created a series of prints um, depicting the sculptures that you would have found, that you still can find out at Bonaventure today, like this one. Uh, that was uh, represents the Taliaferro uh, monument out of Bonaventure, which is right next to John Wall's sculpture of Little Gracie. And I should point out that Bonaventure is a popular site for artists to go out and do plein air paintings today. Uh, this is a work by Jeff Markowski on the left from 2017. And if you're interested in painting out of Bonaventure, Telfair offers plein air painting classes. We're not painting indoors right now due to the pandemic, but Savannah is a great place to paint outdoors. So. I would highly encourage you to check out our website uh, because if you go to our adult classes section under learn, you'll see that we are offering uh, classes like that right now. It's a great socially distanced way to um, take in some great scenery um, to learn how to paint in oils outdoors. Uh, we're offering those on weekdays and on Saturdays. So that's a shameless plug for some of our classes that we're offering. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm gonna conclude my talk and wanna thank you guys for tuning in today. And uh, please ask away, I, I'm glad to answer any questions that you have, and I'm going to stop sharing that screen right now and uh, just let you guys um, take it over from here. You can put your questions in the, the Q&A um, box if you can open that up or in the chat. I'll try to look at both of them if I can, <laughs> and uh, maybe Nicole can help me. Um, so please let me know what you thought, if you have any questions about any of that. I went through a lot of material really quickly. All right, no questions, all right. <laughs> uh, happy attendees though. So, uh, or if you oh. wanna uh, let me know what you thought about the uh, the program today. Um, I'm seeing some, some. Uh, oh, here, here we go. There's a question. Uh, could you please remind us of the origin of the name uh, Bonaventure? So yeah, um, Bonaventure is the name given to uh, to the, the site by, uh, we think by John Mulrine, uh, the original owner, Colonel John Mulrine. Um, I've seen it depicted different ways. You'll see actually in some of the old stereo, stereo cards, we'll call it Buen Ventura, but basically it means good fortune. Um, so that was really, uh, that's at least that's the, that's the most commonly accepted uh, uh, you know, interpretation of, of the, the meaning of the name Bonaventure. And the name did change over the years, as I pointed out, it, it changed to Evergreen when it became a cemetery. And then when the city um, acquired the property uh, in the early 20th century, they renamed it Bonaventure. And it's been Bonaventure ever since. 
And then when Greenwich was added in the 1930s, it became uh, the Greenwich addition to Bonaventure. Any other questions? There's a lot to go into there. Um, I'm sorry, I just threw a lot of stuff at y'all. So um, I usually get a few questions about the bird girl. Um, you guys may have already seen her. You probably have already seen her at some point. Um, and in, again, uh, this is a presentation I'm sometimes asked to give in October. And Nicole says she didn't she didn't ask me for this reason. It wasn't because Halloween is coming, but uh, but it's actually kind of an appropriate thing to do for the season as well <laughs> to go out there. And then um, we did have a question from Mary Ellen Donaldson. Yep. Um, did you can you see that one on there? Or did Let's it go see, to I'm, me? I'm scrolling down right now. So. Other cemeteries were segregated. When was Bonaventure Cemetery integrated? That's a really good question. I was looking at that when I was putting together, I actually did two versions of this Bonaventure show, a larger one, and then the bird girl focused version we have right now. And I really couldn't get a straight answer on that one. Uh, my assumption is the 1960s, basically, when, when um, other public facilities in Savannah were, were integrated, which was about 1964. Um, there are relatively few African-American burials at Bonaventure. Um, what I've told, talking to folks at the monument companies who know best, um, they say that, that uh, Greenwich uh, was a much more integrated cemetery. You see a much more diverse uh, burials at, um, at uh, Greenwich. Um, you'll see a lot of uh, African-American, but uh, a lot of Asian uh, monuments at, um, at Greenwich, for example. Uh, but Bonaventure was, was segregated. And, and actually, at the very beginning, Bonaventure was even like, you know, in the 1840s through the early the mid 1860s, you had to be very wealthy to even afford um, a place out of Bonaventure. So it wasn't until William Wiltberger came in and opened things up a bit, and maybe lowered the prices that you see more burials taking place out there. And of course, the city's other cemeteries were segregated. Um, uh, the um, there are other older African-American cemeteries in Savannah. Laurel Grove South, though, is incredibly fascinating, and I definitely encourage you to visit um, Laurel Grove South, as well as Laurel Grove North, which has um, some terrific um, funerary architecture and sculpture as well. There's, uh, there's also um, some material on the City of Savannah's website about the city's cemeteries. You, there's not a whole lot of information, but you can find little capsule um, descriptions of each of those sites there, except for the old Jewish cemeteries. Those are still private. You can see them. They're walled, actually. Uh, there's one case where you might be able to peek through the gate, um, but they're walled off, uh, but they're still there in West Savannah. And I did mention to Harry as well, hopefully, maybe if things are better next year and we could figure out the logistics, we would love to maybe do some walking tours down in Savannah where we could learn about history, art, etc. cetera. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, maybe for next year, we're going to cross our fingers and see how things like that go. And you also you can also visit the uh, the Telfair and the exhibitions are, are open uh, and you can see this exhibition. Some of the works I showed you today are in the exhibition that's up at the Telfair Academy. Um, we are doing tours. They're self-guided right now, but we can also station a docent outside the gallery or staff member to give you an introduction before you go in. So that's another option if you'd like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if there are not any more questions, um, I do want to mention we are having another virtual presentation with the Telfair on November 10th. Uh, that one will be Emancipating the Past, Reinterpreting Savannah's, sorry, Best Historic Site. I was going to say most best historic site. Um, and that is going to be about the Owens Thomas House. And that is going to be with Shannon Browning Mullis. She is the curator of history and decorative arts for the Telfair Museums. Um, information about that is on the member website and it will be coming out in the next issue of PB Living as well, which should be out to you all within the next week or two. You're also welcome to attend other lectures coming up at Telfair. We have other virtual lectures in the near future. There'll be one in on November 18th by the photographer Frank Stewart, who is uh, official photographer for jazz at Lincoln Center in New York and was a photographer for the Savannah Music Festival here for 16 years. So um, that should be a fun talk that's coming up November 18th and we'll send you information on that. 
Perfect. And if anyone has any questions they think of later or ideas for more things they'd like to hear about or maybe something interesting they saw at the Telfair they'd like to know more about, um, please feel free to reach out to me um, or to the club in general and they can get that information to me. Um, we would love to bring you all the information we can. I did, I did see a couple more questions that are, that are another question that popped up. Um, just the one that is it difficult to, for families to secure a plot at Bonaventure today? Um, yes, it is. Um, it's possible, but, um, but it's very limited. Um, but um, you can certainly talk to the city of Savannah. The other cemeteries like uh, Greenwich, uh, which is nearby and also in that kind of riverfront location are still there, still, still available. But Greenwich, I mean, but uh, Bonaventure is, has become quite difficult to, to, get, to get into these days. Imagine. Oof. All right. Well, last call for questions. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you so much again, Mr. DeLorme. Thank you, Mrs. Renner, um, for being with us today. We are just absolutely thrilled to have you. It was wonderful, very interesting. Um, we have recorded the presentation, so it will be available for viewing later on. We will get that link out to the membership and to you as well, if you would like it. And um, again, thank you all so much for coming. We are thrilled to have been able to put on this program for you. Thank you. It was delightful. Absolutely. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.